Who is Future? Well, you know who Future is. He's the fifth most streamed music artist of the last 15 years. He's the biggest influence for an entire generation of music artists. Not just rap, but also the entire pop music industry started biting Future's sound. But what a lot of people don't realize is that he's also the most misunderstood artist of our time. You know, because it's not an art if it's easy to do. That's what's wrong right now. Everybody trying to rap the same style with the, uh, I don't know who created it, if it was Future or Migos, but all them niggas sound the same. There's a reason why Future not only created the pop trap wave, but he also outlived it. More than a meme, he isn't a trend at all. Future's been making music since before I was born. Over 20 years spent honing the craft of his songwriting and vocal delivery, a story that most people wouldn't understand if they only listened to his biggest hits. He doesn't just make entertaining songs. For Future, music is a science, and his understanding of people and business learned over decades has taken him from a struggling artist with 300 fans to over 50 million monthly listeners. So what can we learn from Future and how can we follow in his footsteps to create our own meaningful, impactful stories? I'm Philip, this is Volksgeist, and you're watching the true story of Future. If you're interested in more of my creations, my new brand Spirit World just relaunched our sold out necklace after it's been back ordered for six months. Every necklace is made of full 925 sterling silver with hand painted enamel and the design of a sun rising over a night full of silver stars. They're designed by me and the brand directly supports Volksgeist while also telling stories with powerful meaning for every creative person. I made the necklaces to be a reminder that whatever your goal is, the only way to reach it is to just keep going. Whatever kind of success you're chasing, persistence and belief is the key, because there can't be any light without dark. There can't be success without struggle. If you want to support my work and buy a pendant from our collection, feel free to pick up at the link below. And shipping is free in the US forever, so go to spiritworld.store to buy a necklace now or stick till the end for a discount code that's just for my viewers. Plus one random buyer from the first 10 orders off this video will have their purchase completely refunded and will get their necklace for free. The tricky thing about telling Future's story is that he hides in plain sight. A lot like his lyrics, the lyricist himself can be difficult to understand. I don't really let people into my world. You've got to save something for yourself. You can't just let everybody know everything about you. Because when you look through almost all of his interviews, there are subtle deflections or just plain contradictions in many of his statements. It's almost like he says something different based on whoever he's talking to. Even a journalist like Elliot Wilson, who's known Future for a long time, says that generally he's funny and easy to talk with. But as soon as the recorded interview begins, something in him changes and speaking with Future becomes a chess match. But forget Elliot Wilson, even Future himself said this. Man, the person I am, man, I can't even really talk about it. I can't let a nigga peep me. I'm telling you some shit. Half of the shit I tell you might be the truth, half, but it might not be, man. One minute, he'll say he really is the person in his lyrics, but then he'll say this. You know what I mean? I'm not like super drug out of drug addict. My music may portray a certain kind of image. I know there's some people that might be super drugged out and they listen to the music like, hey, thank you, he's speaking for me. And some people that's not, they feel like, man, I don't have to do drugs. I can listen to the future and feel like I'm on something. Like, you don't have to try it. Don't do it for you to really have to live that type of life. Sometimes he'll say he doesn't need to change his persona to appeal to his fans. Don't be afraid to be yourself. If you're doing what you think people might like rather than doing what you like, people will see through it. Make the music that I know that people want. I know they want the ratchet shit. But you talk a lot about drugs in your music. Yeah, because I feel like that's the number one thing. So why do we really want to know who Future is? Not because it's a witch hunt, but if an artist's music ranks as the fifth most streamed of the entire decade, it means that there's something in the mixture we relate to, deep down, even if we don't know it. Maybe it's the case that something about Future is deeply human, and good or bad, it really does speak to us. You don't achieve his level of enduring popularity by just being passively entertaining or a momentary trend. Future has had not just a good rap career, but one of the longest ones in modern history. Why and how does someone have what it takes to achieve such an unlikely feat? Who do you have to be to become larger than life? With Future, it's truly hard to say. There are so many inconsistencies in his words. Is the future the world knows now truly him, or is it a method and a plan? 
Maybe there's also a pain he avoids by blurring who he really is. He said in a 2016 Rolling Stone interview, You come to this world and you make two lives. You gotta make the most of your second life. I was born Nevadius, but now I'm future. Should I dwell on what Nevadius was supposed to be, I get a chance to experience life as something else. I wasn't supposed to be like this. So before we can understand future, we have to meet Nevadius. If I didn't meet Future when I met him, he most definitely wouldn't have been Future. He, he, he don't think the music stuff would have ever happened for him. You just heard a quote from Rico Wade, Future's older cousin. But more than just being Future's cousin, he was also part of the production trio Organized Noise that discovered Outkast and produced their debut album. He also started the Dungeon Family Collective, whose members, apart from just Outkast, included Goody Mob, Killer Mike, and a ton of other legendary Atlanta artists. Rico Wade is so influential on his own that some people have called Future an industry plant just for being related to him. Future describes Rico as a father figure, and he agrees that he wouldn't have ever even made music seriously, let alone succeeded, without Rico's influence. Rico is like, uh, like my, my cousin, but he took me in, he more played like a father role, father figure role, just, he was just always there though as support for the most part. But just being related to Rico Wade doesn't make Future a Nepo baby like some people seem to think. The real story is, like all real stories, just a bit more complicated than that. Future was born Nevadius Damon Wilburn in the winter of 1983. Wilburn being his mother's last name because his father wasn't even around to sign his birth certificate. Looking back at an interview from 2016, we know that Nevadius' first ever dream job as a kid was to be an architect or a doctor. But as we know now, he was gradually pushed down a different path. Because Future grew up poor in Atlanta, one of the city's hardest hit by the crack epidemic of the 80s and the 90s. When Future was just a kid in elementary school, the world around him was suffering. His mother, who worked full-time as a 911 operator, was opposed to drugs. She even went on to cut ties with him later in life after finding out that he was selling drugs on the street. But despite his mother trying her best, almost everyone else around Nevadius was involved in crime and drugs. I had multiple aunties and uncles that were on drugs. When you grow up in something, you don't even know if it's bad or good. You just know that's how it is. When you realize that's the kind of life you're born into, a career like being an architect or a doctor can seem impossibly far away. And before long, Future was swept up into a powerful tide and started dealing drugs to make money. In a place like inner city Atlanta, there's often no other way. During this time in Nevadius' life, he was often driven to school by a junkie named Fred whenever his family couldn't, and while he was at school, his grandmother would handle drug transactions with his customers at her house. He was later shot in the hand at the age of 16 and dropped out of high school without finishing the 12th grade. At the age of 17, around the year 1999 or 2000, Nevadius managed to meet his famous producer cousin Rico Wade for the first time. But Rico sent him away thinking he was just a hustler or a scammer from Kirkwood pretending to be his cousin for clout. But months later, they met again at the funeral of a shared uncle, and Rico Wade realized that they were actually cousins. I needed him to be right beside me because I want to know who is my uncle Boo. See, that's my granddaddy. Who, who is my uncle Willie? I want to know all about my family. They all got locked up when we were young. See, that's my dad. And I wanted, the more I know about him, the more I'm going to know about me. The trade off was he was a star. He was already rapping before I met him. But now he got a chance to see this real. And since he was my family, it was like, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the game. I'm gonna give you everything I know. Really meeting and starting to get close with Rico Wade gave Nevadius the hope and motivation for a good life that previously seemed impossible for someone like him. I'm coming from the hood and I go straight to Rico house. He got maids and I never even ate at a good restaurant until I went with Rico. You know what I'm saying? I never knew nobody that was legal that made money into my cousin Rico. Someone who had actually achieved their dreams and dreamed and it came to life one day. Like I actually can. I, I never still took it for granted. I never was like, I just always was a cousin, you know what I'm saying? I never felt like I was future then. But before he found success, he almost threw this chance away. First time I went to the dungeon, my uncle died. I went over there, but I did a song. It was like one verse and a hook. But I really was shy away from it because there was so many people in the studio, then they acting like, oh, it was just his cousin just trying to claim, trying to get the fame, come around. They didn't really want me here, so I just never came back to the dungeon. Then my other uncle died like three months later. So I just thought about it, like, man, forget what they even thinking about me, how they look at me. I'm gonna still just come over here never going back to, to Kirkwood. So I just stayed over there. I ain't go back for like a year. I just stayed over his house. I never left. If they look at me crazy or anything, I just still was just like, man, I'm not leaving. This time I ain't leaving. Everyone else there was about 10 years older than him. And the story goes that at one point, a Dungeon Family member called G-Rock offhandedly said, man, you're the future. And at that moment, a casual joke about his age gave birth to a future musical superstar who would far outgrow the success of everyone in the room. 
Generally, a lot of people assume trap rappers might not be serious artists or businessmen just because of their loud, flashy personas. But I'm always reminded of the time 19-year-old young thug gave insightful marketing commentary on a Reddit thread like 10 years ago. Within 30 seconds of you rapping, how often do you mention bitches, clubs, expensive cars, and booze? Nothing in the first 30 seconds. Everyone knows you want to wait until the 45 second mark, dick. And I've never mentioned an expensive car in anything for what it's worth. I make a product for a certain audience and I'm good at it. Supply and demand, simple economics. I don't do this because I love the attention. I do this because I have a certain skill set that allows me to get paid without the threat of doing federal time. And similarly, today, there's a perception of Future being a larger-than-life cartoon character who doesn't have a deeper story or technique behind the music he makes. But that couldn't be further from reality. It took Future a lot of practice and knowledge to get where he is now. This is what he said in a 2014 interview. Only the OGs. They know that. The young kids, they don't really understand. They just hear what they want to hear. But it's all good. I know the people that understand music, they know where it's coming from. At that time, he was turning 31, and his second studio album had just dropped. But since the age of 18, Future has been working on the craft of songwriting and even production non-stop, learning not only from his cousin Rico Wade, but also everyone else who came through to work in Rico's studio. From a young age, he got to watch legendary artists at work. People like Andre 3000, Goody Mob, Killer Mike, even Trey Songz, Snoop Dogg, Ludacris, T.I. At this stage, obviously, he was just a fly on the wall, pretty young, not too confident, didn't even try to network or say too much, but he was learning the whole time. The Dungeon family artistic ethos was to give people what they wanted, but to still be as creative and different as possible. Every Dungeon member had a different style. That maybe is what helped everybody have different styles. Because if you came, you was around, you weren't going to get those features. Like, you weren't going to be able to even be on each other's albums, you know what I'm saying? Like, unless you had something different. And Future took notes. You can hear it in his influences. Yes, he's always been a rapper, but he's taken more than a little inspiration from other music styles as well. Artists like Barry White, Anita Baker, Marvin Gaye, Curtis Mayfield. Even as a kid, Future has talked about being enamored by hearing his grandmother sing Amazing Grace at the house. I know the essence of this shit. I studied melody, songs like Amazing Grace and the pain of it, he says before humming the chorus. It just feels like pain. It feels like struggle. I recognize pain through melody, and it naturally comes out of me at times. Some of you might not even believe me when I say that Future's favorite song of all time is I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. He's talked about always being drawn to melodies that are simple yet deep and affecting. In one of his later songs, he had the line, all this pain, I can't even rap it, sometimes I feel I want to sing. Learning this about Future's backstory completely changed the way I see his techniques as a rapper. Knowing that his signature melodic rap style wasn't born as a calculated business move to be trendy or to innovate music, it becomes a pretty powerful story. His style began as the human impulse to sing comforting melodies to himself through his struggles ever since he was a kid, alone. It makes Future make a lot more sense. But as we know, it took Future a long time to merge these ideas effectively with his own voice and find the confidence to become a star. His first ever song song was from 2003 called Belly of the Beast. Yes, 2003. And it's kind of shocking that all the way back then in 2003, Future, who used to go by Meathead when he was rapping, sounded almost exactly like Andre 3000. And as he kept practicing, some of the Dungeon family members he was around noticed that he was getting good at coming up with hooks and melodies. And in 2004, he had his first songwriting credit for the hook on Ludacris' song, Blueberry Yum Yum. Mm, man, I never would've thought that it could taste this good. Thank God for the man who put it in my hood. Yeah, that's right. Future, one of the most popular rappers alive in 2024, has been working in the music industry for over 20 years. If you're 20 or 21 years old watching this video, Future's music career is older than you are. But despite his growing talent and the significant industry connections, before he saw any success, Future first had to go through seven years of failure. 
Starting at the age of 20, Future's music career went through seven years of failure. No matter what he tried, he was stuck. Obviously, he made a lot of songs, but none of them ended up being released. Some songs were lost to his cousin's work for bigger artists since Rico needed the money and Future needed Rico to keep growing and learning. So I'm working on some. He might have an idea. I said, we're gonna use that for Luda. He's like, cool. Nah, man, you're taking my song. Oh, cool. To be a great leader, you gotta be a great father. Yeah. But other songs, and I mean potentially life-changing songs, were lost to just bad luck. I got a Dungeon Vault now, old Andre 3000 record, and he came by the studio to do a song with you. That verse, he, put, he never put it out. But that, no, that was the hardest don't. verse but that in was, the that world was something still. You said. He said it to 3000 face, he said, my cousin was so, he did, this is him talking about me. I, he was, I was so excited. And 3000 put that verse down, like he was gonna change my life. Oh my God, I'm gonna get a new house, I'm gonna get dipped. So we put this song out, yeah. shit never came out. This phase of Future's creative growth was so devastating that he developed a fear of recording in any basement studio from all the times he was let down and his career was stalled in the Dungeon Family basement studio. I don't really even record in the basement no more because when I was in the dungeon, it felt like when I was making music and the bottom, it never came out. So I always like to record at the top now. But the bad luck went outside the studio as well. Rico ran into trouble with the IRS and lost his house, and Future had to go back to Kirkwood and resume drug dealing to stay above water. He then got arrested multiple times. It's hard to imagine yourself in that position, sitting in a jail cell over and over, always wondering why you just can't catch a break. You have the skills, you got some opportunities, you even met some musical legends, but despite getting so close to life-changing success, you're still back at rock bottom. Life was not letting Future forget where he had come from. Don't nothing smell the same, your food don't taste the same, nigga. You can't even eat right. Over 21 and you looking at all the mistakes you made and that shit bottling up and you like, nigga, man, I done fucked up so much and get myself to this point where I'm just in life, nigga, feel like you ain't nothing. You know what I'm saying? So I done been to that point where like, man, any chance I get, man, I can't never see that person because I know I ain't built for that. I'm built for greatness, you know what I'm saying? And that shit'll tear you down. At a certain point, Future's present became too painful to bear, and the future seemed like the only place where his hopes for a good life were possible. But then, 2010 came. Nevadius slash Future, whoever he was at the time, was going to turn 27 years old, but he had zero music releases and zero fans. Age 27 was when Jimi Hendrix died a legend and was remembered for eternity. Future was still a nobody. His legend didn't even exist yet. But for some reason, 2010 was the year something changed. He ended up recording every single day. No matter if he didn't make anything, no matter if he didn't complete a song, he spent every single day in the studio. And he never stopped until his dreams came true. I've been going to the studio like every day straight for like 10 years. Even if I have a show, I still do some music. So find a way to record it. And I just don't know how to not record. You know what I'm saying? It's just hard for me to get away from it. The calmest place I can be is a studio. And I stay in there because I know when I come back out, it's back to reality. If you're angry all day, man, stay in the studio. After having lost so many opportunities to mistakes and misfortune, Future got one more chance in 2010 when a popular local rapper Rocco took an interest in him and featured him on his mixtape. After its release, Future did notice some people really liked his verses. In short, he had around 300 fans. But being paranoid of staying stuck forever, he immediately rushed to carry the momentum from this window of opportunity and dropped his own mixtape 30 days later. My first reaction listening to this era of Future's music in 2024 was shock. In one music video, you can see Future driving around an ugly base model Camaro wearing a really terrible looking fake blinged out watch. Either way though, Future's lyrics, persona, and visuals are kind of the same, but also very, very different from what he does now 14 years later. But then I heard the song statistics and it surprised me even more. This isn't the kind of writing you would think of when you hear the name Future. The song starts out with a spoken word poem by Dungeon Family member Big Rube. Then Future comes in with a hook. The streets is where I got respect at, where I got my stripes in, Wikipedia can't check that. These mixtapes aren't exactly amazing, but Future was definitely starting to figure out his formula. Before long, he got a feature on YC's track, Rax. It spread like wildfire from clubs to forums to radio. Eventually, it even peaked at number 42 on the Billboard Hot 100. Rax was basically a breakout hit. Obviously, both of these artists were excited to have a hit, but Future wasn't exactly happy. He wanted more. He had waited a long time for this opportunity and wasn't going to let it go, especially because as the featured artist, he wasn't getting a lot of buzz. He ended up deciding to make his own mixtape in under a month and put Rax on that project to capitalize on how much potential 
potential his verse had. In the next 30 days, he completed the Dirty Sprite mixtape and released it immediately. And as racks continued to blow up even more, it led to a commercial release as Future's first real official song. From having 300 fans in May of 2010 to now trending on national charts, Future's dreams seemed closer than ever. Rax gave Future a glimpse of mainstream success, but to avoid being a one-hit wonder, he needed to build a foundation. And for Future, this core foundation ended up being strip clubs. You ain't no rapper, all them statistics don't mean shit. A regular street nigga don't give a fuck about how many times you went number one, like how many white people listen to your shit, because they don't even think that, them, them niggas, the farthest they think is the club. Who's selling this club out? That's who they think is the biggest niggas. In Atlanta, the strip club that launched the most hits was Magic City, and Future's music did great at Magic City. They kept playing him all the time. The more they played him, the more fans he got. Soon he was crushing the underground music scene, and within a year, he was offered a deal from major label Epic Records. He became an overnight success at the age of 28, after 10 years of failure. But what kind of music got him there? Future committed to this idea of making his music more gritty pretty hard. I don't know what to do, pull up a three or four, my sprite so dirty fool, my bitch remind me all the time, we drink a few in the official music video for Dirty Sprite, it starts off with his girlfriend warning him not to drink lean. He has to hide it from her to keep drinking, but at the end of the video, she starts drinking it herself as the demented piano in the background and Future's lullaby-esque melody honestly makes it a pretty weird atmosphere. But years later, in a 2016 interview with Rolling Stone, Future began dismissing his own involvement with lean. At first, it wasn't something I loved. It wasn't until I discovered what I loved about it. Some people take drugs and they don't understand the high. They take it just to be high. It started making me more relaxed. I don't feel like I ever abused it. I used it for what I felt was needed. And Future really changed the game. He came out with a new style that was at first weird and unheard of. Yet he didn't leave anything to chance when he didn't gain instant traction. He just kept pushing forward. He dropped a total of nine mixtapes from May of 2010 to January of 2012. In that time, he went from an unknown 27 year old who'd never released a project to one of the biggest names in Atlanta. But after being signed by a major label and given access to a bigger budget, would Future's sound change in the pursuit of mainstream success? How would he go from a strip club rapper making low budget music videos using loud, cheap instrumentals to one of the most iconic artists alive 10 years later. At this point in his career, he had achieved step two or three on the career list. Have some local fame, get signed to a label, but he was looking for step 10, become a star. But still, as Future had learned after so much bad luck and misfortune back in Atlanta, success is never guaranteed. What would he have to do to find step four, five, and six until he got to the top? On 19th of September, 2011, eight days after the release of Streets Calling and 10 days after signing his first major record deal, Future released his first official single and the first major moment of his career, a song called Tony Montana. Sometimes being called the first ever mumble rap song, he later said that he was so high in the recording booth he couldn't even open his mouth. And when he heard it again the next day, he didn't even know what he was saying. But it ended up being a hit anyway. And the label needed a remix to boost Future. Lil Wayne offered to get on the song, but Future didn't want to get overshadowed on his first release by someone so big. Instead, he went with a fellow rising rapper a 25-year-old actor from Canada who was quickly breaking into the rap game. But looking back, they're a lot like two sides of the same coin, going through an interlinked journey, riding the wave of hip-hop's rise to become the new pop. But like anyone who was destined to change the game, Future was also already facing mockery from critics, especially for the unintelligible lyrics on Tony Montana to the extent that he constantly had to explain his artistic and strategic choices in every single interview he did. Right now, you know, it's a time, time where you gotta dumb your lyrics down and uh, cause people ain't that patient. And, and, and they got a short attention span. Like you gotta catch their attention real quick because they gonna be going on to something else. 80 babies, man, they crackheads. Future would say, you know, you wanna make music to change the radio, not music for the radio. But resonating with the mainstream was also what he needed. Future's debut album, Pluto, was commercial, but it also wasn't. I wouldn't say he was chasing the radio. I would say he was waving at it. And it worked. This project had his first three hits, Tony Montana, Magic, Same Damn Time. Go to AZ on the flight, mail a hundred overnight. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
The album even debuted at number 8 on the Billboard 200, which is nothing to laugh at. The production was a big leap forward from his mixtapes too. It's full of futuristic synths and electric guitars that range from distorted power chords to high-pitched psychedelic riffs. At the same time, it has small, easy-to-miss references to his real self that comes so quickly it almost doesn't register in the larger atmosphere. Listening to these tracks now in 2024 made me feel for future. It has to be a really isolating feeling to have these raw moments in your music where some hidden pain spills over for everyone to see, but people don't even notice and keep saying future doesn't show himself in his lyrics or you're not supposed to pay attention to his lyrics at all. If Tony Montana is your biggest hit, but you're also dropping bars about the darkest moments of your life, it's a difficult position to be in as an artist. It makes me wonder whether the grimy, hard, drugged out mixtapes were just what he did to get his name out there. He did say in a 2022 interview that what comes most naturally to him was writing soft, melodic songs. I make those in my sleep, but I had to make a certain kind of music to go along with my career and everything that was going on at the time. I was capitalizing off different moments and creating from whatever was going on at the time in the world and my personal life. I was taking the energy from that and making music, but those melodic songs, I make those easy, even easier than I can make a rap song. So now, after all of that, did Pluto make Future the star he needed it to? It turns out Pluto did its job perfectly. From getting your first major songwriting credit on a ludicrous song to having him as a feature on your own track, 10 years later, Future's buzz was electric. It even traveled into mainstream pop when he got featured on a Miley Cyrus song. As a songwriter too, he was pretty sought after. He wrote and featured on Rihanna's 2012 song, Love Song, and he also wrote Body Party for Sierra in 2013, which was her biggest commercial success since 2004. And apparently, he even originally wrote an early version of Beyonce's huge hit, Drunk in Love. Back then, he wasn't credited, but the genius page for the song does list him as a writer. So in 2013, all the fiends are running to get Future's crack. They don't want T-Pain's crack no more. T-Pain's crack got too much cut on it. And that's just all it boils down to. Future took over T-Pain's track. One of the most common descriptions of Future's work at the time was most rappers talk about drugs, but Future's music makes you feel like you're on them. And as early as late 2013, people were talking about noticing his style popping up in other new artists as well. A reporter asked, Some of your signature techniques now pop up all over rap and pop radio. Are you happy to see the ways you've mutated rap become the mainstream? How do you respond to copycats? And then in 2014, journalists from Rolling Stone were less subtle. Following Future's example, hip hop radio has turned into a cyborg parade. You can hear his influence on young MCs like Rich Homie Kwan, Ty Dolla Sign, Kid Inc., and Young Thug. Fetty Wap seems to have gotten his entire style from Future's 2012 song, Turn On The Lights. But despite all of the success, it was still almost like no one respected his methods. People at Pitchfork were even saying that Future would probably fade away just as quickly as he came up. Future may soon flame out, but his current status as rap royalty is one of the best things in recent memory to happen to a genre that has almost wholly succumbed to sucking the singularity out of its pop stars. So could Future jump into the mainstream and secure a career for good, or was his style a brief trend? It's a difficult position for an artist to be in after trying so hard and for so long to break through. In early 2014, his doubter's predictions almost came true. His second album, Honest, was trash. Future kept saying he never chases the radio, but Honest was, at the very least, jogging towards it. And that's not the fatal flaw, though. What's worse is that it sounded confused and bland. It almost felt like someone forced Future to make this record. Even Ben's friends with Andre 3000 was forgettable, and it feels like Future basically wasted a super rare feature. Listen to the song Blood, Sweat, and Tears, for example. At best, this song sounds like Hey Soul Sister mashed up with Imagine Dragons. What is this supposed to be? A song for high school graduations? Music for weight loss reels? You can hear Future's love of singing and melodies, but it's still just not quite there. Years later, Future admitted that this album wasn't true to him. He said, On Honest, I wasn't being honest. But somehow, things got worse. 
Just three months after the birth of his son with his fiance, Ciara, Future's public celebrity relationship came to an abrupt end after she caught him cheating. She went on to say that she couldn't grow anymore while being with him, and the backlash hit him hard. Online hate, mockery, people telling Future that he was washed up, a C-list rapper, his career was over. I was scared as shit. I was one step away from being married, and I feel like I failed publicly in relationships. Then you want to go back to doing music, to what you know. And if the people didn't accept you again, the one thing you feel like you can fall back on, it walks away from you. You start to feel like it's over. Yeah, that's right. The future we know today, the human embodiment of misogyny, was about to get married back in 2014. He called. She belongs to the streets. Especially with Ciara going on to say things later about how her new man that she married just a year later made her feel like this. He's an amazing father. Like watching him with all of our kids is like, it is one of the sweetest things. It's one of the sexiest things, to be honest with you. But what hurt Future the most was realizing that people cared more about celebrity gossip than his music. I had got to a point in my life where my relationship was bigger than my music. And it really just like killed me. I was like, man, they don't even care about my music no more. They care about if I'm on a red carpet, the next dinner date. That's not who I am. It's just, I've been creative. I've been saying trends. I've been saying music. So I was just like, man, I wanted to get back into that lane. It was just like, man, I'm not doing no interviews so I can explain it. I want people to think whatever they want to think about me. And then I want to make music. And then I want my fans to be able to connect with me. He ended up disappearing from the public eye. He moved overseas to be alone, avoiding interviews and doing what he knows best. Recording, recording, and more recording. The humiliation and rejection that he felt, the real possibility of losing everything, Future took all of that and he made music with a darkness that no one expected, maybe not even him. Now, almost a year later, this is how his new mixtape starts. <laughs> From the first minute, the darkness is immediate. His vocal tone sounds almost unrecognizable from any of his so far songs. A calm yet demonic gurgle before booming bass attacks your ears. The cover art shows a disgusting beast that just happens to look a lot like Future himself, disfigured beyond repair. Most of all, it's completely different from what anyone expected. The song Monster also takes it to another level. The old Future was gone. All my niggas some junkies, they keep that bread on them, dog. Yo, la ho is a monkey, she got a head on her, dog. In a 2016 interview when talking about making Monster, Future said, I embraced what I thought people were going to hate about me. He was opening up and it wasn't pretty. Throw Away starts off like any other song, but at the two minute mark, there's a beat switch that makes it an entirely different track. The tone shifts to abrupt sadness, the come down after your high wears off. It feels like a flashback with all of his memories overwhelming him, reminding him of the person who he used to be and the life and everything else he lost on his destructive path. Ciara had moved on with a new man. Meanwhile, Future was in a state of denial, anger, and heartbreak. The track starts off with Future calling someone disposable, but it ends with him realizing he's the one who feels like a throwaway, abandoned by his old life and love. Whatever pain he went through, he's here to repeat the cycle and inflict it on someone else. But you can't sit and stare at your wounds forever. The rest of the album, besides this really heartbreaking track, for the most part shows Future as nothing but an absolute monster. There's one lyric in particular from My Savages that tells a lot about Future's story. The famous doing a lot of damage to my friendships. It escalated and let me would have been a jump ship. And it's the love from. For Future, DJ Esco was a crucial friend. He was actually one of the top DJs at Magic City a few years earlier when Future was first making his own name, before he ever had any mainstream success. He also became really important musically for Future's albums. Thanks to the guidance and motivation from people like Esco, after Monster, Future was back on track to become a star. Keep in mind, I don't really have that big of a face out there. I was purposely being behind the scenes mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Future's in front of the scenes and I didn't want to be up there like I'm trying to get. You hadn't done the 
the dance oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I was trying to be like, I'm in house. I'm in house producer. I'm get the bass. I'm DJ on the road. I'm DJ at Magic City still. Like, but I wasn't doing being on videos. I'd always be like, nah, I'm cool. I'd be right in the back behind you, behind the camera, on the side of the camera. But there was a problem. 22 days after the release of Monster, while Future and his team were traveling around for a small tour, DJ Esco was arrested for marijuana possession in the United Arab Emirates. Mind you, a strict religious monarchy without laws for due process you would expect in the US. He ended up locked up in jail with no expected release date with the hard drive with every single song Future had recorded in the past two years in the possession of the police. They don't give you no water, no food for like the first couple of days. You don't, you never know how long you're going. The, the justice system doesn't work. Like you get to count down your days because that, that would ease your mind if you knew how. If they would have told me you're going to be in jail 56 nights, then I can put my brain into a mode of and count down. see the light at the end right. of the tunnel. They don't tell you when you're getting out. So every day is another wonder of when you're going to get out. There's people that was in there for three, four years and they still ain't got a court date. Future couldn't get in touch with Esco. He didn't know what was going to happen to one of his closest friends. But on top of that, he was concerned concerned about losing the momentum generated by Monster's release, since all of his music was locked up in a foreign country. Beast Mode, along with Monster, offered future fans two new sounds they had never heard before. It was another hit mixtape just two months after his last one. Two days after Beast Mode was released, DJ Esco got out of jail after spending 56 days in a cell. Esco insisted that the next mixtape include one particular song from the confiscated hard drive. He had been listening to this song on the flight to Abu Dhabi, and it was also what he hummed to himself throughout his time in jail. The mixtape was finally ready. It was named 56 Nights. The song Esco mentioned was March Madness. The producer of this song, Tarantino, said that Future told him not to send him any trap beats and said he asked for beats that didn't even sound like Future's style. Tarantino was supposed to make new beats as if he was making them for another artist. And it's easy to notice how it sounds nothing like Monster, Beast Mode, or any of Future's other records. The drum groove is definitely trap, but the ambient soundscape is synthetic like you would hear in EDM. Future was creating forward-thinking trap songs and hits at the same time. These releases pushed trap forward and it revived Future's career simultaneously simultaneously, and it might not have happened if Esco didn't go to jail. The pressure and desperation brought out a new level of creativity in Future's work. I would've never made 56 Nights if he went and went to jail. I would've never made Beast Mode if he went and went to jail. Dirty Sprite 2 would've never been an album. Like His sacrifice is just is like a big sacrifice for me. To go to the next level was Esco getting locked up. Future was finally ready for his third album, the record that would not only become his best project, but also be considered one of the most important albums in modern rap history. It was time for Future's grand entrance to the mainstream. As the wave of mainstream pop trap was beginning to rise with artists like Metro Boomin, The Migos, and Young Thug, he wasn't going to get left behind, but he still needed a masterpiece to make it happen. Dirty Sprite 2 was the perfection of his sound, and it came at the perfect moment. The first song, Thought It Was a Drought, starts off with an intoxicating, menacing instrumental. You can hear him shaking the cup of lean just like you could on Dirty Sprite back in 2011. But in the 2011 song, he sounded like a man flirting with darkness. In 2015, he becomes darkness. The beats are dark and looming. His flows flip from aggressive to laid back. It all adds up to become a trap masterpiece containing tons of sounds and styles. I Serve the Bass has a demonic, distorted, industrial sound. I play the games of the thrones with you. I can't change, I was God given. Try to make me a pop star and they made a monster. I'm posting with my niggas in the champagne. Looking through the track list, you can really see how influential Future became by releasing this album. Groupies blends distorted bass and heavy drums with pianos and even sirens, while Future raps with the vocal tone of a literal monster showcasing a technically skilled, fast flow. He talks about sleeping with groupies, but it isn't sexy. The music sounds like a man losing his humanity. Slick Talk is so toxic and egotistical that Michael Phelps later admitted to listening to this song on repeat to get in the zone for the Rio Olympics. Remember in Rio when I made that face that ended up all over the internet? I was in the zone with Future's track, Stick Talk, blaring in my headphones. 
He's been on an the tracks Freako and Real Sisters show traces of what we'd later hear in Playboy Cardi's style, Yeet as well, from the strip club bounce and their drums to the 8-bit video game sounding instrumentals. Black Amigo gang got them bells on us. Way before the fame I had a bell on me. 20,000 off a jug ain't got a scale on me. Later on in the album, there are much mellower, more introspective, deeply personal lyrics. Blood on the Money has an ethereal Japanese folk sounding melody with the feeling of someone having remorse and flashbacks from getting tired of all the destruction they've caused. The lyrics see Future flexing vaguely, but also talking about his misdeeds like he's shaming himself. There's a sense of hopelessness like he knows he can never change and go back, and how being betrayed in love destroyed him. The final song, Know the Meaning, is also the most emotional and maybe the most personal future song ever. Country, I need this. 56 nights, gotta know the real meaning. The drop monster tape and had to go to Europe. Best thing I ever did was fall out of love. Skull came to me, said it, thank you, washed up. You need to go back in, show these niggas who the one. We're going back in soon as we get off tour. He had my hard drive on him when he called the case. He doesn't even try to be subtle. He just starts talking in the middle of the track about the exact troubles he faced on his path to securing a good life through music. He starts off by talking about some of his family members, a lot of whom are dead. Then he mentions some glimpses of his childhood, then the troubles he faced while DJ Esco was in prison and Future lost his friend as well as all of his music. The song puts you in his shoes, looking back at everything he had to do and endure to finally get to a good place in his life. His career was cemented, he's got enough money to not fear going back to poverty, but at what cost? His humanity had been traded for survival. A lot of the time, that's the true cost of manifesting your goals, losing everything to get the one thing you always wanted. Are you even capable of enjoying this good life after losing so much to gain it? Maybe it seems like peace just didn't suit future anymore. Maybe life for him had become a perpetual battle. If all that you know is overcoming obstacles, you won't know what to do once you're done. With DS2, Future officially became a legend. An entire generation of artists started borrowing his production styles, his auto-tune rapping, what they said in their raps, their ad-libs, their subject matter, and even the way they behaved in public. And the craziest thing is, he's only gotten bigger since then. Because Future kind of quietly became a superstar. Ever since DS2, nine years ago, he's been releasing albums and mixtapes almost constantly, without ever dipping in popularity. With nine albums, 24 mixtapes, and over a hundred singles, I'm not going to cover his entire discography. It's not possible. But in the last eight years or so, what a time to be alive with Drake, Love Backwards, Future, Hendrix, Beast Mode 2, High Off Life, I Never Liked You, The Wizard, and now We Don't Trust You with Metro Boomin. These have all been massive releases. Future just keeps getting bigger. For a long time, he held the record for the most ever Billboard Hot 100 entries, over 120, and he's achieved eight number one albums across a period of 10 years. That's not even to mention the ridiculous number of hits. From Tony Montana back in 2011 to Jumpman, Mask Off, Life Is Good, Wait For You, his features on Heroes and Villains, and now Like That with Kendrick Lamar being the biggest rap song debut in four years, Future's longevity is once in a generation. He's kept growing a lot even since the late 2010s. A lot of his music in this second half of his career is his best work. Even beyond the hits, he still makes soulful, emotional, atmospheric songs, as well as bangers, and it's been a winning formula. I Never Liked You was one of my favorite albums of 2022. Deep cuts like Voodoo, Chickens, and Affiliated, they're hard to beat. Hendrix still sounds fresh to me to this day. Solo is one of my favorite songs ever. Artistically, he's one of the most influential rappers alive. The modern rap family tree would fall over without him. He massively influenced the rise of artists like the Migos, Young Thug, 21 Savage, Gunna, Lil Baby, the way he breathed new life into autotune was nothing short of game changing. But what does it all add up to? Is Future a pop rapper without depth who found a good way to make sales? Or is he a master of his craft who changed the game? Who really is Future? A lot of people don't regard Future as particularly special, but I think that's a big mistake. If I had to sum up Future's artistic ethos as concise as possible, it would be be smart, but don't look smart. With most people assuming that he's just an artist who makes simple songs, it seems like more of the case that he portrays a mysterious persona to let people project themselves onto him. When he talked about wanting his music to feel like drugs when even he doesn't use them anymore, it became obvious the kind of game Future is playing. More than anything, the work ethic is undeniable. He spent years in the dungeon with his cousin Rico Wade, studying songwriting and studying melodies to find out what works without getting anything out of it for himself. Working with Andre 3000 as a teenager, writing for other artists and even struggling for years to get put on in the industry without any success, it's pretty clear that he loves it. Everything from his unique vocal texture to his songwriting to his melodies, it's a 
result of passion for music. He made good mixtapes, he made bad mixtapes, then he made good ones again, to a point where now, 20 years later, he's arguably a top five rapper alive. Back when he was standing around in front of a fake Camaro wearing a fake Rolex, that didn't seem like it was ever gonna be the case. Sure, it seems easy to be where he is now, but it happened over a period of decades, the same way it would happen for anyone else watching this video. It takes years to find success, years of sustained effort without giving up. But still, critics call Future's music easy, but it's only easy to replicate. It was very hard to originate. There's no lack of people trying to be like Future, but almost none of them can just copy and have the same emotional impact. But I guess that's what many people call the paradox of creativity. The best work appears so obvious and clear that people don't understand the effort it takes to get there. But no matter what, Future is more than a meme. He's the embodiment of an era of culture, and he got there by manifesting what he wanted through his entire life. You don't get to where he is without living your goals and putting up with whatever it takes to get there. So who is Future? I think we all know who he is at this point. He's the misunderstood genius of our time. But he never would have gotten there if he didn't have a good work ethic. The main reason why Future manifested the success he wanted so bad was because he didn't give up. That's something I always want to remind all of you watching these videos. There's nothing different between you, me, and Future. The fact is, he worked and kept going and found his dreams. They don't just happen to you. You have to keep looking. And that's the meaning behind the spirit of creativity, the solid silver pendant I designed from my new brand Spirit World. The recursive wings, the blue gemstone eyes, it tells a story about pushing forward. It represents the journey of an artist or a student or an entrepreneur looking for success and finding their own path. It embodies the idea of working to achieve your goals even when it feels impossible to keep going because that's when it actually matters. Creativity and art isn't easy. Meaningful art doesn't get made without meaningful work behind it. We're all sitting here watching videos about successful artists and people who have changed the world because I I want to motivate all of you to pursue your own dreams and never give up because the only thing crazier than chasing dreams is not chasing dreams. The spirit of creativity is an emblem of that story. It reminds us of what we're all capable of and gives us the strength to get there. And it's the same story with The Darkest Night and The Brightest Day, our other pendant that tells a story about persistence and determination showing a vibrant sun rising over a night of silver stars that's finally back in stock after six months of being sold out. So if you want to support my new brand and invest in high quality silver jewelry that represents something real, you can go to spiritworld.store and get both of our pieces right now. And as always, feel free to use the code Volksgang for a discount. Supporting this brand makes Volksgeist possible, and I appreciate all of you doing that. I'm Philip, this has been Volksgeist, and thank you for watching.